Okay, committee. Welcome, Senate Finance. Um, we are going to continue our walk through today, trying to find a solution to our deficit in the Ed Fund. But um, you know, we've been told to just declare bankruptcy and go home. So maybe that would be a solution, and just walk away from all those pensions and all that stuff. And I don't know, when Harrisburg and I think it was Detroit declared bankruptcy, I was at Encoil and the insurance and bond market went berserk. So um, I can imagine what would go on if states decided to do that. I have never heard it suggested. So we're gonna assume we aren't going bankrupt and we are going to figure out how to use that, fill that deficit, even though um, despite being told we would be able to use some of the CARES money to fill revenue slots, the directions that I saw at least four times today said we could not. So we are here with our deficit, um, at least for now. So we're going to start out with so Graham and Mark. May, just a quick uh, clarification yep. on that. So does that mean <clears throat> that we're talking about largely, of course, things that are where we're responding to responding to COVID-19, but also new projects, new initiatives, or are no, they? It, it can't be used to fill revenue losses. Right, right. For already budgeted items. programs is my interpretation. And I think I've seen several that agree with that. So mm -hmm. uh, school is budgeted. Yeah, uh, and we are looking at significant revenue losses, and I think we've all agreed that schools should probably open in September, health, you know, standards allowing. Right. Uh, but education of some form will have to be delivered in September, end of August. So we are here, mm -hmm. um, and Mark and Graham. I just keep hoping one of you is good. Well, I think Graham's might be going to give us some good news, but <laughs> um, we're going to start with what's the revenue forecast up, uh, Senator Ballot? Just a clarification, Ann, since um, when we saw some of the language that seemed to be in this latest package, it seemed like they were giving some flexibility to the states. And you're saying the guidance that you're seeing is not saying that. So where's the I I there? I will stand. I just read the document and it said couldn't be used for revenue shortfalls for so where there's going to be some gray area in there but I am not going to assume that we're going to get to use 100 million dollars um, and I'm starting to get a little nervous about going through the one billion uh, if you start to look at proposals that are out there. So I'm, I'm working on the assumption that the bulk of this at this time we're going to have to deal with this year's and next year's. Um, if a windfall comes our way, then I'll happily jump on it. But I didn't see anything that said we could make up for revenue shortfall. Maybe some flexibility, but I didn't see a lot. I will, if somebody else has read it differently, I'll stand by that. Graham, are you going to be first? I think so. Madam okay. Chair. Um, I'm Graham Cam from the Joint Fiscal Office, um, and I'm here to essentially. Um, give an update to the committee about where revenues stand. Um, I think just um, before I start that, I think the discussion that you just had about regarding the CRF funds is the correct one. Um, the guidance was issued by the treasury last night and specifically multiple times made in uh, comments that this revenue could not be used for 
um, revenue shortfalls or operating expenditures that would have occurred anyway. Um, there was some, some chatter in the most recently passed, I'm not sure if the House has passed it yet, but the, the, what they're calling CARES, you know, one and a half, um, which helped, which refilled the PPP loan um, pot of money, that either there was going to be some more money for state and local governments to use for revenue shortfalls, or the existing CRF money in CARES 1 would be the language around that would be loosened up to be used for revenue shortfalls. Neither of those things um, appears to have happened. So um, we're kind of where we were before um, in terms of with that money, except for the fact that we have actual guidance from the treasury on this money at the moment. Um, and so there has been some talk of President Trump, I think tweeted that they would look at the state and local aid in the future bills, but at this point, it's it's rather uncertain. So, um, I would I think that's all I know at the at the moment for the, the CRF money. That's why um, Senator McDonald had a question. Uh, does the state have a budget yet? Uh, not a past one, no. And um, have we established what we plan to the state plans to do for state aid education yet? Good question. Um. Yes, I think it's the sales tax of the way the law is written. There's no general fund transfer. Okay. Okay. Senator um, Pearson. Oh, Senator Pearson has a question. Yeah. Well, I I think I understand what Senator McDonald's is driving at, and and yeah. Graham, can can you? We've talked about this. It's usually been a several part test, right? Not budgeted and in reaction to the pandemic. Uh, is that still where we believe the that's, money? that's where we stand? Yeah, and not budgeted and then also necessary. Um, there's, I mean, I can send to Faith the document that the Treasury released, but there's some examples in there about what is now what might be an eligible expense. And most of those examples are um, expenses incurred for COVID relief, um, like healthcare expenses, things like that. There is a section which talks about potentially um, off, if you if the state were to offer some economic assistance in the form of what they, uh, for payroll for businesses, that might be an eligible expense. And so there is some gray area still left over in the guidance um, that was issued by treasury. Um, Although it's it specifically says multiple times not for operating and must be necessary, um, so not much has changed from our original interpretation of the money as it came as it was passed in the actual bill itself. So, so if Graham, schools had extra expenses if they bought <clears throat> iPads, if they bought routers so that students could learn remotely there's a chance that might be covered, a chance. Yeah, I mean, I don't wanna get yeah. ahead of what might or might not be an eligible expense, but that's the kind of, I think, thrust of something that would be um, used. I'm just pulling up the actual document here so I can- Grant, broadband, for example. I mean, this could be, you know, we're, we've recognized that we have you know, a massive, we've known this, but this is highlighting a massive infrastructure deficit on our part. Good broadband, I mean, uh, fiber, that kind of thing. Seems to me that the case might, and I know you, you're, you can't be judge and jury on this, but it, it seems to me that that kind of thing, where we're, where we're learning that we have <clears throat> deficits and preparation, as the pro tem said this morning, which I thought was a really good point. How do we prepare for um, how do we sort of do an analysis of what we did well, what we didn't do well? How do we prepare in the future for these kinds of things? And I guess my, I guess the one question I could ask you, Graham, is what are the penalties if, if a state were to make a mistake, a legitimate mistake? We invest a lot of money in, <clears throat> in broadband right now. And, and, you know, somebody says, oh, you know, tis tis, you guys, that, that really doesn't fit the bill. What happens? I don't know the answer. Okay, so there's nothing. No, we you don't have haven't that. seen anything along those yeah. lines. Okay. We aren't that far. I'm 
still getting concerned that we're going to go through this money very quickly. Um, there's just so many proposals out there. But okay. um, oh, yeah. we're going to go through the money unwisely and in an uncoordinated fashion. That's right. right. Yes. With respect to broadband, because if we go through and we spend all the money on things that people say they want and need right now, but we have no plan or no integrated strategy around it, we're going to, it's going to be a disaster. We're going to spend a lot of money that's not necessary. It's going to be uncoordinated. It's not going to fit together. And logically, it may not make a whole lot of sense by the time we get done. And this is particularly true if we fragment how we do it in terms of who's responsible for it. So I, those, I think, are significant risks that we need to manage. Mm -hmm. I think part of the reason that joint fiscal has asked to have everything but the immediate health and safety expenditures, once we get to, to go through the appropriations process, and as I understand it, as requests come in, they, um, I think it's on joint fiscal's website, there will be a listing of how, you know, of the requests and then of how the money's being spent. But we need to watch that. There's already a group talking about reopening, but at some point we're going to have to make a coordinated effort. I think we know where we made some mistakes last time and we'll make some this time, but hopefully they'll be very small ones. So, Madam Chair. Yes. Just, um, Donald. The I don't expect that we would have the answers to the questions that we might be asking today. Right. But every year, the relationship, the, the ratio between the state's share of education and the, and the um, property tax or income tax payers changes. And every year we ratify that change and we debate it and argue it. We raise or lower the tax rates a, a penny here and there. We haven't done that yet. Um, and I, I would ask someone in the days to come, if we decided to restore the oh, share of McDonald's the ed fund paid for by, by um, the state, we could, could we not do that? We, the state pays shares less of the revenues than they used to before um, the big recession. And the homeowners and property taxpayers have never caught up. Um, that's a policy decision. So. Someone well, needs to tell us what what constitutes a, a, where we've crossed the line and where we haven't before we concede the choices we might have. So, a year ago, we began the work of the Tax Structure Commission. Take a look at all of our taxes and how they work, what reforms were necessary on a gross basis. And they're due to report back to us at the end of this year. It might be useful for us to hear from them at this point to say, well, what have they done and what have they found? And is there any direction that they're, they're, they're moving towards to resolve the issues that, because these, these issues existed long before COVID-19. And again, I'd like to see us do this in a logical rather than a reactive manner, because one of the problems for the tax system that we're in right now, is we keep adding Band-Aids and making it worse. Oh, we keep cutting taxes too. So were we going to get a uh, numbers update from committee? I want to let you know, Senator Cummings just got booted from the meeting. I don't know why. So she's <laughs> not here. <laughs> that doesn't mean you can't go forward with Grant, Where's Al Haig? But I wanted to let you know. Um, I, I mean, I'll leave it to the committee. Do you want me to continue with the, the numbers and then it seems to me like we should give her give a few minutes, right? Yeah. So well, while we're waiting, maybe I can jump in. Um, Senator McDonald, the, the, the problem with doing what you're suggesting right now is we don't have a forecast yet for 21. And we should have it by next Wednesday. And at that point, we can do the kind of analysis that you're looking for. Yeah. Right. And the numbers that I'm going to give right now are only fiscal 20 numbers. So um, we had a good, a, a, a very detailed analysis from the tax committee, deputy tax commissioner was tax commissioner yesterday who updated us on the various funds and sales taxes and rooms and meals. 
and that's for this year. Mm -hmm. Come on, Madam Chair. Just texted her. I haven't heard from her yet. So Mark, maybe you'll tell us what you plan to tell us. <laughs> um, I, I don't have a lot to tell you. I was just, Graham was gonna give you a revenue upgrade and I was going to show you that what that does to the education fund outlook for 2020. It's pretty straightforward. It just, you know, the, the, the revenue downgrade is not as bad as it was, we anticipated. Went from 89 to about 69. So the deficit in the education fund for FY20 is better than we thought initially, but it's still bad. Okay. And we've sort of been operating on the principle that before we start making decisions about next year, we have this year nailed down. So we're not trying to, so we know what we've already done. Yeah, but I, I think it's really, likely, it's really likely that we're gonna be carrying a significant deficit forward yep. from FY20 into FY21. And we'll have an empty, empty stabilization reserve. So um, yep. it's it's a big big problem. Mark, uh, I have I have a, a Bible here. Do you think it should be sworn in, or are you prepared? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm waiting for Al. <laughs> here she is. You're muted, Senator Cummings. We don't know. Welcome okay. back. Okay. I think we'll go to Graham right now. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to attempt to screen share here. Hopefully this doesn't. Oh, Faith won't let me. <laughs> um, Does Faith have it? I'll let you, Graham. Hang on. Okay. This is, this is posted on our website, so. Um, <coughs> Graham, try it now. Okay. Can everyone see that document? Yep, we can see it. Okie dokie. So um, I'm going to give you an update of um, what Tom Cavetta shared with us as of April 17th for fiscal year 20 um, revenue impacts. And as Mark said, um, while we were waiting, the only real change here, uh, um, as the <coughs> committee has seen last, is in the education fund, really. Um, so the- uh, Graham, can you make that a touch bigger? That good? Better? Yeah. Well, um, can't see all of the last column. Okay. Yes, I can't, I know about the, but that's because I've got people going down the side. Yeah, I have the so same Graham, I'm sure I've seen it. <laughs> Um, so at the moment, we're looking at about talk, accounting for both the shifts in revenue from fiscal 20 to fiscal 21 um, and the actual revenue downgrades from economic impacts from COVID. We're talking about $381 million across all funds. Um, and um, that's broken out by the three funds on this sheet. And so the, the line that's highlighted in red here, that's what is what I'm calling the economic impact. So this is the amount that's just pure loss. Um, and then the bottom line here is the revenue deferrals line. Um, and so there's some talk that if some of the revenue deferrals um, came in before, all these, some of these deferred revenues came in before July 30th, um, then it's possible that we could uh, book them in fiscal 20. So we're sort of um, not quite counting them as revenue losses yet in fiscal 20, but I'm just highlighting them here just so the committee's aware. Um, so in, total, in terms of total losses, so the sum of the three red numbers here is about $170 million. 
$61 million of it's in the general fund, 42 is in the transportation fund, and 69 million of it is in the education fund. The clear um, change here is the education fund. That number used to be a uh, negative $89 million. Um, so it's been, a, it's been an upgrade and that was largely due to not necessarily um, improvements in the economic outlook, but um, Tom Cabet and Jeff Carr made some um, technical corrections to their modeling. And so it had a roughly $20 million impact. Um, and so that's by and large the, the main difference in the, in the estimates that um, today versus what the committee has seen. I think it was last week that I presented these. Um, so I guess at that point, I think I saw a hand from okay. someone. But I can't see the last column in red. Is that 50 uh, that is come in, we think will come in in July? So, I've, got, I've got participants going down the side, so. Okay, it's just so um, on the last column is the education fund. Yeah. And so what, that, what the situation there is, is there's about $69 million worth of economic Economic. loss. So just lost revenues from businesses being closed, the sales tax and the other room tax, but also the lottery. And then there's an additional $41 million in potentially deferred meals and rooms and sales and use tax. Um, You recall the administration waived interest and penalties for the March 25th and the April 25th um, payments of those two taxes. And so um, the way that the economists are treating that deferral is that they think that that revenue will continue to be de- potentially to be deferred. Um, and so, but I'm putting that down in the bottom category here because so long as that money comes in before July 30th, there's, um, it's, it's, it's possible that we can book that as a fiscal year 20 revenue. Um, so it's okay. not really a loss. But uh, yeah. oh. when we started out, we were, the number we've been using is 19 million deficit for this year. Are we still in that ballpark? 19 million for the education fund? Yes. So I think Mark can, can maybe better, but what okay. the last thing I think he presented to you, the starting point was a negative $89 million loss in the Ed Fund. And then once uh, you added in the stabilization reserves and things like that, it was, I think, what, 39 and a half, Mark? Yes, that's right. So, yeah. and then there was the 20 million calculation change, which is, I guess, where I got to 19. So, yeah, uh, I think Mark might give you an update. Okay. On that. Mark, do you want to tell us yeah. and then sure. we'll get to questions? Sure. So, Faith, do you have the uh, document that I sent to you? Before we leave this document. Okay. Oh. Senator Pearson. Uh, um, there oh. you are. Hi. 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 Um, so, uh, Mark or, or Graham, I, I was yeah. hoping you could explain the interplay between 69 and 41 in the Ed Fund. So, you're saying we're we're attracted to be down 69 million, but we may get 41 late, is what I'm seeing, and I'm trying to understand. Does that mean we're down 110 million, or does that mean we're down? What's the opposite? 18 million, 20. No, it, million. yeah, sorry about the, that confusion. What it means is the $69 million is just right now, that's just gone. It's that's sort of the best case scenario under these estimates. So 69 million is the loss in revenue from places just being closed, consumers not buying as much, not going to hotels, not buying lottery tickets, stuff like that. Right. The $41 million is an additional chunk of money that has been deferred, um, or I should say the penalties interest on that money have been waived. And so those are payments for, for March 25th and April 25th on the meals and rooms and the sales tax. So, so long as the people who owed the money in March and April make those p- payments in May, June, or before July 30th of this year, that 41 will come in. If they don't make the, that money, that's additional loss. So worst case scenario here is that none of those people have the money to make that payment. Um, and you add another $41 million on top of the 69. So you right. have Thank you. 110 million. 
Okay, Sandra Sorokin has a question. Michael, you're muted. Michael? No. I got it. Okay. Sorry. Um, not sure this is related specifically to the Ed Fund, but uh, are there comparable charts on the spending side? Um, how much reduced spending we're seeing in, or increased spending we're seeing in the balance of FY20? And also, what about, you know, federal receipts, if there's more uh, food stamps or less food stamps going in and out? I mean, are, are, are there, no, if we're looking to balance a budget for FY20, we're talking a lot about the revenue losses, but another part of it is adjustments we need to make on the spending side. So in, in, in FY20, we can't make any changes on the spending side at this point. It's all it's all local spending. So that's on the, the education on the Ed Fund. Yeah, on the Ed Fund. Yeah. yeah. And the that's what fund. we're we're trying to get a handle on right now. And that's the rest of this afternoon right. is trying to get a handle on where school spending is. Um, and is it over? Is it under? Uh, we're, we're still trying to get a handle on that. I guess my question was more general to the other funds as well. And maybe Grant could briefly answer that. Yeah, I don't know if I have a, a satisfactory answer. I think the administration is keeping track of the amount of money that they're spending related to the crisis. Um, yeah. We have a grasp of the federal monies coming in. Um, and I think it's probably, um, somewhat accurate to say that a lot of the expenditures that are happening right now are probably those that are eligible for some of this federal money. So the CRF, I mean, most of the expenditures happening are related to um, the COVID-19 crisis directly, so public health spending, things like that. Um, and so those would be more likely eligible for CRF money and then additional other monies that were in the CARES Act. Um, but these ones here are, are more just straight up losses of revenue. And so these are the ones that um, notwithstanding any sort of additional federal aid that the state is gonna have to, um, um, is gonna have to make up for, in other words. I've lost you again. Uh -oh. I can hear you. I can hear you. I'm trying to shut it off because there's a phone ringing here. No, cancel. No. We can see you, Ann. I, I'm back. Okay. All right. I was trying to shut off the microphone, but it was covered by another pop-up. Okay. So I think the approps committee is doing as much tracking on you know budgeted spending for this year and we can ask them for an update but i haven't heard anything on money chairs all right so we ready to go to mark mark you have a document i, I do faith do you have that document if you don't i can put, put it share a screen but um, is Faith still on here? Let's see her. Please share the screen. If I can share a screen. Oh, I'm disabled for screen sharing, so. Ram, you're the a host, so you can make Mark a co-host. <laughs> I do not have a screen share up here right now. All right, face the host now. All right, I'll let Faith take over. So sorry, this is Faith. Were you looking for something from me? I just got yep. it out. Faith, Faith, I sent you um an, an updated education fund outlook. I'm ready to share that, Mark. Hang on. That'd be great. Okay. That's what we're looking for. There okay, go. there it is. And a little. So, um, all right, if we're, as long as we're at the top, the numbers that Graham has been talking about show up on here on lines 
three, four, five, and six. They're non-property tax monies that support um, the education fund. Yeah. That's the revenue um, downgrade that was changed. So we're better by about $20 million. So it can, Faith, can you scroll down to the bottom? So we don't have to spend a lot of time on this part of it. But if you look down at the bottom, where it was 30, $39.5 million on line 26 as a deficit, the deficit's now dropped to 19.9. But, so there's not a whole lot to tell you other than that. That money, you know, it's, it's, it's good news. We're not quite as bad off as we <laughs> were expecting to be in 2020. But going forward to 21, while I have you here, um, the problem next year is we have to make up that $19.9 million deficit on line 26. On line 28, that reserve is gonna be gone. So the, the, the stabilization reserve would need to be um, made up. Both school boards have already um, voted to expend about another $74 million next year. And even if I assume that we collect as much as 80% of the non-property tax revenues that were forecasted in January for the education fund, we'd lose about 114 million there. So we've got a really, really big hole right now in FY21, given that a lot of the spending has been locked in, almost all of the spending has been locked in, but the revenues are really uncertain at this point. Okay, Sandra Pearson. Mark, I've heard you say a few times that our, our reserve targets, uh, with an assumption that we would pop them up after using them this year, um, what if we were arguing that the crisis is bad enough that we are not in a position to replenish the reserve funds? Is that a notwithstanding our statute is that uh is that a, a risk with with the rating agencies can you just help me understand that because sure. surely that is a reasonable argument given so the, so the, the easy the, the first part of it is an easy answer in january when the tax commissioner makes recommendations for 21 the, the statute requires that he assumes that the education fund stabilization reserve has been restored so you'd see a big tax bump in there for 22 when you come through, um, but I think that the education fund can can run can run a deficit. The question there, and I'm not the best person to answer this, is what the impact on that would depend on how rating agencies viewed that going forward. They like to see a five percent reserve in the fund if they don't see anything there. I don't know how how that affects the state's borrowing costs or um, that kind of thing going forward. So. Just got a thing from Moody's Analytic that said that Vermont was one of 12 states that was in a position where it might survive this uh, financial crisis with only a 5% reduction and it was because of our reserves. Mm -hmm. So we've done a good job there, but I'm pretty sure I can remember not fully funding the reserves, uh, mm -hmm. probably during the last economic downturn. And we, but all of these numbers are also based, Mark, on, we're working on the assumption that property taxes are going to be paid. Two things. First of all, it assumes that the that the yields that were set back in December, the property tax parameters that were set in December, are the property tax parameters that you would use next year. Yeah. So in those, there's a built-in five five cent increase on average for homestead taxpayers, and a six cent increase for non-homestead property taxpayers. That's one. And then two. Yes, you're right. It assumes that all of the property tax education property tax money that's due in both FY20 and in FY21 is collected. So what I'm talking about and in some sense is a best case scenario. So, you know, I, I, I hate to throw it out there, but just the small group here, so just I'll throw it out. We're looking at a, a problem next year that ranges from 150 to $250 million. I mean, it could, could be a quarter of a billion dollars to get schools fully funded next year based on what we're looking at right now. And if we can't use the CARES money, the 1.25 billion, Options are pretty limited. I don't know what else you would do other than go to borrowing. 
So right now, though, because we haven't removed the 8% penalty, mm -hmm. the law says that those monies will be paid to the Ed Fund. It is the town's responsibility to collect them. Yes. And for some towns, especially poorer towns, that amount of borrowing might be difficult, but um, but no, but you're right. The way the way the law stands right now, if a municipality is unable to collect the full amount of education property tax that's due to the state, they have to come up with that money however they can, probably by going out in short-term borrowing. borrowing. So if we do away with that requi request that requirement, which we've been asked to. Right. The it would probably trend to more towards 250 million is? Um, no, yes, I guess it would be on the higher end of that, but we, we haven't, yeah, we haven't yeah. factored that part okay. of it. Okay, well, we don't know, because we don't know. Right. How many people are still working remotely? How many people, we know how many people aren't working because we've got on insurance claims, but we, I don't think, know who's working and how much they're making and how much property, you know, who in that group is paying the property taxes. So um, it's a lot of unknowns out there. Right. And, and like I said, Ed, by next Wednesday, we'll have a revenue forecast. It won't be an official forecast, but I don't know what else we would use because um, we're not going to have an official forecast, I don't think, until, you know, end of the summer. And tax rates for the education fund have to be set set before then. They have to be set before you adjourn or ideally before June right. 30th. So um, it, there's going to be continuing uncertainty going all the way forward. On the general fund side, you can pass a one quarter budget and come back and deal with it when we have a better sense of where, how, you know, how, how everything is sugared off. But with the education fund, because we need to establish rates, we've got to make those decisions based on um, incomplete or you know not not as great information as we we would like to have to make that decision. Mark, do you know is any of the money that the care money that's going to um, schools come in? Um, I Brad Brad's on on. Brad will do that. He, okay. Better to know that than I do. I know okay. that they're waiting for guidance at the agency. You're muted, Brad. <laughs> All right. There's Brad. You're muted. Muted. Can't oh, hear. Right here, corner. <laughs> no, can't hear him. There. Okay. Okay. You're unmuted. Um, at, the, at the moment, no money has come in. As far as I know, we have not received the application yet from the feds. Um, okay. That's being worked on. It's supposed to come out anytime now. Uh, they, we were told last week it'll be out at the end of this week. That's where we are. But no money has come in yet from the CARES Act. Okay. And have we gotten the um, list of what it could be used for? Is it just a flat grant or? The only thing I'm aware of still is just what is in the CARES Act itself. There, They list 12 different um, uses for it. I would say 10 of them are fairly narrow. Um, two of them are fairly broad, but it's not wide open money. But I, we're expecting that they will be giving us guidance on how to use that and, for, and further details, what it can and cannot be used for. Okay. All right. I'm watching the, oh, we're, okay. So committee, any other questions for Mark? All right, then. We're a little behind, so I'm going to move on. And this is um, the second section of our agenda, which is updates on school budgets and plans. Brad, you're on first. Do you have things to tell us? I have I have what the business manager told me. OK, um, that's and since good. I haven't done this in a while. Just for the record, Brad James, Agency of Education. Um, Faith, would you pull up the one that says um, FY20 expenditure update, please. It'll take me a minute. Hang on. That, that's okay. I don't know how to do it at all. So, 
what what this is is um, I asked the business managers yesterday afternoon what roughly what their increased costs are and what their potentially reduced costs are due to the school closures and such yes. um, and what's what's going on with them and this is a kind of a compilation of of what they had um, and I heard I heard back from just about twenty five percent of them uh, well there it is thank you Faith. Okay. Um, so I heard back from about 25% of them, um, and the ones who specifically talked about their additional costs, um, eight of the eight of the twelve, twelve of them responded directly to that question. Eight of them said that they thought their costs were going to be marginal, incremental um, at best. They weren't going to be very large. Um, four of them reported that they were going to have rough estimates. Who gave me actual numbers of between sixty-two thousand to one hundred seventy thousand um, dollars. I don't know if that is by other people, I don't know if that's considered incremental or marginal. I'm not sure what there's what their scale of magnitude is in terms okay. of what they're saying to probably depend on the size of the school budget. I, th I think partly, but most of these districts were most of these SUs were roughly the same size I was hearing from that. And there's obviously some flexibility in there, but most most were not terribly different. But it, it, they're all doing things a little bit differently. Um, they are all saying that they're what one of the things they're doing is they're using their money differently than they anticipated using it because schools are closed. So they're shifting money from one pocket to the other. Most of them are still working very hard at keeping all their staff fully funded at 100% of their salaries. Um, so that's going on, kind of following the governor's directives. So anyway, so so the the cost the cost is there. It's it's not insurmountable. If I was to take what those twelve districts, well, really those uh, four districts, report an actual number, and well, I did that wrong. I think about it because that should have been times more. Um, give me a second here to turn on a calculator. If I was to take their their numbers, their their total increase in spending for those four, the report was for about $480,000. And if I was to multiply that by 13, just assuming that's kind of an average because there are 52, so 452 is 13, we would come out with additional costs of about $6.3 million for the, for, for the districts as a whole. Um, Again, these are very rough numbers. Nobody's really going to stand by these numbers. I told them that I wasn't planning on standing by these numbers either. So. Right. I think then, we're just trying to get yeah. an idea of trends right now. Are they spending a whole lot or a whole it, lot well, more I mean, or less? It, it, it's a good question, and I think it's a relative question. I don't think I don't think anybody's spending as much as they anticipated some spending. Um, but I think if you look at that as that rough number, maybe call it $6 million for the state, that's, that's significant money. Is it huge money for what's going on? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. By the same token, they're offsetting that a little bit by reduced costs. Um, and again, I had only a few re respond to about reduced costs, the actual, an actual estimated number. But um, three of them said that they were not that their mark that their costs that they would be able to reduce were not very large. But in a lot of those cases, they were offsetting their increased costs, so they're kind of at a net zero. So a lot of them are kind of at a net zero at the moment. There's still a large number of districts out there who are not sure what their costs are going to be in terms of what the either expenditure or reduced costs. It's it's still unclear because it's very early in the game for them. Um, the two who reported cost to me were 31,000 or reduced cost, pardon me, were 31,000 to 150,000. So there's, you can see there's a, there's a discrepancy there. Um, one, one SU did say that they were potentially going to have a very large fund balance at the end of the year because of they're not, their schools are closed and they're not spending a lot of money on busing or anything like that. That, that, that was a, a significant amount of money for them. Um, so it's, I, th I think the takeaway is, I don't, I don't have good answers obviously, but I think the takeaway is kind of all over the place. But I would say that probably if I was to take that number, if I was to kind of take a net number, multiply that by say 13, let me just putz around here for a sec. Okay. 
I, I I think probably we could be talking about a net number when I when I take into account what they've told me about um, reductions, cost reductions of maybe four million dollars total cost, total increase. Okay. Uh, when you net it out. So so that, that but, kind of gives you an idea of I think of roughly a lot of lot of parameters on that. Uh, mm -hmm. Real big error bars. But a rough idea of the uh, an increased cost of four million dollars this year. Okay. They roll so forward next year. Roughly, we aren't seeing a trend towards huge savings or huge overruns. Um, the numbers we're talking about, four to six million dollars, is not that big. No, I, and I think I think the general trend is to toward more cost as opposed to uh, reductions. Reductions, to yeah. Okay, Senator Pearson. Thank you. Uh, Brad, are food costs uh, wrapped in here? Because I know sometimes uh, cafeterias are off budget and there's there's a whole ver variety of how we handle right. that. And I'm just curious if your understanding is that's- my, under my understanding in general is that food costs are rolled into this. Um, a lot, a lot of you're you're right. A lot of districts run their their food services and enterprise fund, which is supposedly self self um, self filling self uh, funding. Yeah. Um, but most of the time, they are, end up to be a, a transfer from the school general fund to help that enterprise fund out. But my understanding, from what I've heard from most people over the course of this past month, is when they're telling me when they're talking to me about numbers and costs, food is a big part of it. A lot of them are seeing increased food costs. They're, they're not getting the revenue in from, self, from the meals. They're sending food out to people. Um, they're still paying their food staff at 100%, even though they're not necessarily working full-time in some cases. Um, so they're, so they're, their costs are not going down. Food, food costs seem to be going up in general. There is money coming in. I don't know much about it, but there is money coming in from the federal government in terms of um, offsetting some of those food costs. But, but again, as I know you've talked about in Senate Agriculture, the the offsets from the federal government do not are covering the cost of a meal. Thanks. Okay. All right. Any other questions for Brad at this point? Brad, do you have anything else to tell us? Yes. There, okay. there, 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 are, there are a couple of things there. And Faith, if you keep scrolling down a little bit, a little more. There you go. That's about the end. On, on the number five that you're looking at there, um, yeah. I, 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 I guess I mentioned that. They're, they're, most of them are, are paying their, are continuing to pay their personnel at 100%. Um, for FY21, that's really where the big concern is for people as, as it is for you too. Um, business managers are very concerned with, with what revenues are, are gonna be available to them in FY20. Um, they're worried about the increased costs specifically for compensatory education, special education. Um, and, and potentially increase mental health services. Um, one of the things that they're worried about right now is also for FY20 are a reduction in revenues. Um, there is some concern about transportation revenues not being paid out and there's some concern about special education reimbursements not being paid out based on how people are working. Um, in terms of the transportation, what is happening now will not impact reimbursement for transportation this year. Um, and that's because the transportation reimbursement from the state is based on the actual cost for transportation from two years prior. Um, Calvin just gave me a message, excuse me. Um, the special education is, is a little bit more detailed and we're working on that right now. Um, a lot of the special education personnel are not working full seven hour school day, eight hour school day, whatever it happens to be, um, although people are still paying them for their full time. So the question is becoming what, how, how will that be reimbursable? And I, we're looking into that. Um, I was, we're looking into how the, um, they do time studies twice a year for most personnel and they, they and each, each time study lasts a period of a week for state reimbursement purposes. So we're trying to use that and roll that forward. There are some cases where some personnel, such as paraprofessionals, um, if, if their job duties change and they have to do another, a, a third time study, 
And so there's some people who are in that pot now that we're trying to figure out what to do about that. But it looks like we'll probably be able to say that most of those costs will be reimbursable. That's not a definitive answer quite yet, but that's where we're looking at. We're, we should have a decision for, for that in a few days. I need to talk to Secretary French about that once I gather some more information. So I think those the, the FY20 revenue should be okay. It's really FY21 that people are very concerned about. One other thing in terms of coming forward in FY21, that's that last paragraph I threw on that sheet, is, is the use of reserve funds and end of year surplus. They're both treated slightly differently. Um, a reserve fund is set up for a specific purpose and can only be used for that purpose unless the voters choose to do otherwise at a special meeting or a special vote to change what that's for. There's been some, some question as to whether that could be. Um, What's the term I want? That could be changed for a year or two uh, to, while, while we work through this crisis, this financial crisis, um, with the understanding that it's strictly to, to offset some of the increased taxes that are probably coming down the road. The second one is end of year surplus. Um, generally speaking, what the law says for that is that that gets rolled forward into the next available budget to offset costs unless the voters choose to reserve it. But what, when you read the language in, in the statute, what it's really talking about is an audited surplus. So if you, if you come up with an end of year surplus this year, FY20, it would be audited in FY21 so they knew what size that surplus was, and it would then be available for use in FY22, so two years out. So there's some question as to whether that language could be changed a little bit for a while too. Um, so, so that's just some things to think about as to what could possibly be done. People are looking for business managers are looking for ways to use their reserves that they have and uh, potential, any potential surplus they may have at the end of the year. They're looking for a little bit of flexibility as possible. Okay. So, committee, any questions? Ah, I'm back to seeing everyone. Okay. Anybody have any questions? No. All right. Thank you, Brad. <clears throat> I'm sure we're going to see more of you as we work our way through this. Along with others. <laughs> Madam Chair. Yes, Cedric I, I Campion. Just, I guess the only thing that um, I'm wondering is if all these concerns that we're having with regard to how these dollars are being spent or that where we can't spend them, are we communicating this to our federal delegation? I suspect the pro temp would be that point person. I'm just wondering if we've if, if we've done that or if, if that's something we need to be communicating. I will look to Senator Ballant, but my right. assumption is that the administration, um, who as we know has been very focused on property tax rates yeah. and um, probably almost every other state administration is in some form reaching out to the delegations in DC. I think, you know, we got our answer from the leader of the Senate last night, which was considered bankruptcy. Um, and, you know, you've got other people that would like to give us billions of dollars. So, um, we don't know yet, but I'm, I have no doubt that as we work our way through this and as administrations have the time to actually focus on something beyond the immediate crisis, and we are probably reaching that point in this state uh, where we might be able to take a breath, um, that we're going to find stuff out. Senator Ballin, do you know? So only thing I would add for Senator Campion is we do have a, a joint rules committee meeting tomorrow afternoon, and I will bring it up with both the speaker and the pro tem, because I think a combined statement from all the members of leadership on both sides of the aisle from both chambers could be useful to the delegation if we haven't already um, made those overtures through the speaker and the pro tem. Great. Thank you. All right. Okay, so next on the agenda is Jay Nichols from the Principals Association. So Jay, you're yeah, okay. You're unmuted and welcome. Thank you. Step one. And the 
floor is yours? <laughs> what does it look like <laughs> from well, your point I'll, of view? I'll share a few things with you. Uh, three, four minutes of testimony, then take any questions. Thanks for having me. Uh, Jay Nichols, Executive Director of the Vermont Principals Association for the record. Uh, thanks for the opportunity for me to share a few general thoughts around uh, the education fund and budgetary issues. Uh, first, I wanna share some concerns uh, with consideration of major cuts to staffing, as I said previously. So we must be careful not to cut away human resources that our children will need now more than ever. Mm -hmm. Virtually all of our students will have adverse academic impact from this loss of real high quality instruction despite all of the best intentions to do remote learning well. And our most vulnerable students will have major academic loss and regression in many cases. And maybe more importantly, the social emotional impact and challenges these students are facing and will face will fall directly on school employees' shoulders to carry that burden. Uh, as I've said before, human resources will be more critical than ever. That said, 80% of our school budgets roughly, four fifths are in personnel. So if we're gonna look at cutting budgets down the road, we're looking at, looking at cutting people. This will also potentially mean more people leaving Vermont and more people are on our unemployment rolls. So we need to consider all of that. Uh, the second thing that hasn't been touched on much until Senator Campion's question a minute ago, he mentioned uh, what the CARES Act can be used for. Um, I think the bigger advocation in terms of education funding needs to be around the next stimulus package that's being considered. Um, I think it's critical that our legislation and administration advocate strongly with our federal delegation in the US Congress that the, that the big stimulus package being contemplated passes. This is scheduled hopefully to pass sometime in May. Um, it needs to have funds to stabilize state governments uh, and you know, to make sure that it can backfill for school positions. And I'm really thinking about 2021. Uh, the original CARES Act is historical, much needed. You're, you're working your way through that right now. However, that's really more of an immediate urgent cost um, stabilization plan as opposed to more of a stimulus education plan. It's more about spread, stopping the spread of the coronavirus. It's a short-term package. Mm -hmm. um, this, in this short-term package is the biggest economic crisis has hit our country and the world probably since World War II. Uh, my understanding from talking to an economist yesterday is that our deficit in relationship to GDP is approaching World War II levels, which is the highest it's been in the history mm -hmm. of our country. Um, I've always been critical of, of federal debt. I tend to be a, a conservative, uh, fiscally at least, uh, but this is a time when I think the federal government needs to step in. I can share with all of you a letter that I have signed on with other school leaders across the country, if you'd like. Our national principals associations, there are two of them, our national school boards association and the American Association of School Administrators, which is the superintendent's national association, have all supported this. And together we're advocating for a $173 billion package across the country to help backfill revenue for district states for education revenue costs lost uh, caused by the COVID-19 economic problems. This is roughly two thirds more, Brad can correct me if I'm wrong, than we received from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Acts. Um, that, the need is that big. States across the nation without extra funding from the feds are looking at budget cuts for education between eight and 20%, uh, according to some researchers at the Education and Commission of the States and at our own regional Northeast Educational Research Lab. That's, that's scary. I've talked to principals across the state. We're hosting three calls a week, um, one with elementary, one with high school, one with secondary. Most of our calls to date have been around crisis management. How do we get these kids broadband? What are we gonna do about assessment and grading? What are we gonna do about graduation and ceremonies? But the last week or so, a lot's been shifting to worries about the financial future, uh, especially about next year. Lots of worries about potentially losing staff when they expect great academic loss, and more importantly, tremendous worries about students' social and emotional well-being and ability to access education, quite frankly. Principals are stressed out with their day-to-day -day responsibilities during this crisis, as are teachers and other school staff, and they're really worried about the future for their students who they know will be more vulnerable than ever before. So assuming we're, we are left essentially without any extra support from the federal government, and we have to do this all by ourselves as a state after this initial CARES Act, without the necessary federal support to avoid potential drastic measures of the state. I think there are things that we could do. There are all things that would be unpleasant and painful in one way or another. However, I don't think there are things that we should discuss uh, in a legislative committee necessary. I think the better approach here is a short-term budget approach and to have a better sense of what revenue will look like, what the federal government will look like, to get us through this fiscal year. 
uh, and then see what the economy might look like when it reopens. Uh, finally, uh, from my perspective, uh, my colleague Jeff Francis at the Superintendents Association said, I think a week ago or two, or two weeks ago in this committee, that he thinks the next logical step is for the administration and key legislative leaders, along with our associations that are represented here, meet to brainstorm potential solutions to this financial crisis. We at the VPA support that concept as the best strategy moving Good. forward. And we welcome the opportunity to be part of those discussions. Working together, we are more likely to come up with solutions that don't devastate our education system and our response to children's needs, while also addressing the real financial situation we are in as a state. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for affording me the opportunity to share these thoughts. Thank you. I think my hope has been that the schools, all of your associations, the towns, uh, the legislature, that we all can have this discussion together. Um, we may get more federal money, we may not. Um, maybe getting close to an election will do it. I think the thing we're struggling with is, I know this. Uh, the plan is we will do a budget adjustment for this year for the state budget. And we will do, and they will do uh, probably a three month budget for the first quarter next year. But we've got to set a yield um, so that the towns can get out their tax bills. I think all of that may get a little delayed, but come August 28th or September 1st, whatever day it is, you've got to know you've got money to open school because uh, even if we find out in October and November, we get shut down again because there's a flare up, but it sounds like going to, might be a little smoother going to remote learning this time because we've done it once, but it doesn't sound like it's saving huge amounts of money. So you're gonna need that money in place. And I think that's where we're probably seeing or feeling more pressure than all the general fund folks. So. Um, yeah, I can see that. And I think yeah. waiting a while on the yield is certainly the right, right approach as, as we see what happens with the economy, whether we can reopen and so forth. And I do right. want to mention on the remote learning aspect, you know, it, 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 may, it may well go more smoothly the next time, but we still have major infrastructure problems as a state that make our most vulnerable students almost unable to access quality. Yeah. And we, we know that we've been looking at federal money. Um, if you could help us figure out where's the biggest concentration, you know, because if we, if, if we get federal money and we have to go you know, one road in this district and one road in that, we're probably not gonna get that much money. But if we have districts that really have whole sections that we could do, that would be helpful. Um, yeah, we can I, get that, we can collect a lot of that information. Unfortunately, in many places, 80% of the people live close enough or have the, yep. to have the internet and 20% don't right within the same location. I was talking to people in Alberg today and for years, they were all set with high speed. Uh, they had great cell phone access. And then something happened, one of the Verizon towers, it's going to cost too much money to fix it. It hasn't been replaced. And now people in Albert don't have internet anymore or very little. Oh, well, maybe they should call the Department of Public Service. Yeah, maybe. And because there's been trouble with E911 up there too. So, um, all connected. Senator Brock, I think, is taking notes. Many notes. Many notes. <laughs> uh, he knows I love him, so it's fine. <laughs> okay, so that that yeah, and I, I I believe Jeff Francis had trouble talking to us, and he's about a mile from the state house. So, um, you know, that's his fault for living in an area that has ledges. But um, you know that it it is not smooth. I mean, you don't have to go much more than a mile from the state house to not have cell service. And um, so we will, our, our internet. So we'll, uh, we're working on it. But anything you can do to help us 
figure out where and because at some point we're going to have to make some decisions. Okay, any question for Jay? Committee. All right. Okay, so we'll move on to Sue. Okay, Seg Seglowski? Seglowski, yes. Okay. Floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Sue Seglowski, Executive Director of the Vermont School Boards Association, for the record. Thank you very much for the opportunity to provide you with an update on school budgets. I'll talk just briefly first about the 19 districts that don't have an approved budget yet. And then I'll give you uh, some information about our overall approach to keeping school boards informed about the status of the um, education fund. There are 105 school district budgets that have been voted on in 2020, 96 were approved, nine were defeated and 10 districts have not held a budget vote yet. What does the future hold for budget votes for those 19 districts without an approved budget? There are temporary elections provisions that are in effect um, for 2020 only, which grant the Secretary of State authority with the governor's agreement to order appropriate procedures in light of the COVID-19 virus. And I won't go through all of the um, possibilities, but one of them is requiring mail balloting by requiring town clerks to send ballots by mail to all registered voters. The Secretary of State has not implemented any of these alternate, uh, alternative procedures yet. The Secretary of State has issued guidance stating that elections scheduled for April and May should be canceled if at all possible. And under these circumstances, the 19 school districts without approved budgets are facing great uncertainty about when and how their budget votes will occur. And also uncertainty about the ability to see a budget approved in the current economic crisis. The SBA has called for an approach that would provide the 19 districts with legislatively granted spending authority for FY 2021, equivalent to their FY 2020 approved ed spending plus an inflator based on the statewide um, increase in ed spending from uh, FY 20 to 21. And that would be approximately 4%. The worsening economy and potential legislative response to the resulting shortfall in the education fund is likely to lead to severe pressure on all districts. So to not stabilize these 19 districts with reasonable spending authority would definitely disadvantage them as they work to navigate the crisis. I want to be clear that we're not seeking any necessary, uh, unnecessary dispensation or special advantage for the 19 districts. Our goal is really to see that they're placed on comparatively equal footing with those districts that saw budgets approved before the onslaught of operational challenges and fiscal deterioration resulting from the COVID-19 crisis. These districts have been the subject to the same challenges of every other district in Vermont in the early days of navigating this crisis. And they will be striving to serve children and communities in the same diminished economy under the same state and federal policies that are established to contend with this tragic event. Several so local education officials. I have one question. Sure. Uh, I know the towns that have voted, voted 4%, but was all, were all the budget proposals that didn't get voted on for a 4% increase or more? No, they differ. Um, there is a chart that was um, developed, I believe, by Brad James and the Joint Fiscal Office. Uh that um, I could send to you or they could send okay, to you. Okay, well, Brad's got his hand up. So, okay. Brad, do you want to chime in? Yes, um, that was a good lead in, Sue. That, that is actually on, I sent that to Faith and that is actually posted there. It shows something that I did for Senate Education, I think last week that I have updated uh, because House Education asked for it yes, to, for tomorrow. Um, and what it shows is it shows the nine districts that, that had failed budgets kind of where they are, if there's any in, update. And it also shows where the um, 
what the potential increases were for the, the 10 districts who have yet to vote. Um, okay. I can look at it very quickly and give you a rough idea of what that average would be because I have it up here somewhere. I have too many things open. Uh, here we go. <clears throat> um, Faith is loading. Okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah. In, in terms of the, the, the percentage. Increase, little faith. There we go. Did, did you get a faith? Let me go back there. Then. Yeah, we got right, it. So, so I even I can read it. All right. Oh, good. Okay. If you would scroll down a little bit, Faith, to where it's the not yet voted section, because I think that's what Ann was asking about. So yeah. that's that that column that says proposed educate percent education spending to start with a 5.6% for Caledonia Cooperative. Yeah. Um, that's the number that you really care about for the education fund, not necessarily yeah. the change in budget. So if you look at if you look at those, you can see where they are. And I'd say probably it's probably averaging probably around the four percent range, maybe maybe. Yeah, a bit higher. Uh, that's just my not very mathematical sense. We've got a yeah, few I'm, significantly over and a few under. Yeah, and I'm looking at the comparative size of the districts. Uh, Granville Hancock's tiny, Oxbow's reasonable sized. Yeah. West River's not that big. Wyndham Northeast and Wyndham Southeast are not, uh, they're probably the bigger ones, the bigger ones. Um, and Essex Westward, obviously, but they're they're down, they're, they're lower. So as, Essex Westward is by far and away the largest one in terms of population. So they would weight the yeah. average. Now I'm becoming a geek, so I'll be quiet. Okay, so we aren't over paying everybody. All right, and it, this if this is if they don't pass their budgets. I thought I saw a headline that said Montpelier was looking or somebody's looking at drive-through voting. I guess maybe you could get your ballot by mail or get it in your car, fill it out, and Barry Town. Barry Town, okay, and fill it into the machine. Which, well, it's Thunder Road. At Thunder Road, okay. Get a little race in while you're at it. Um, but that that is actually for places that use a voting machine, um, an interesting concept to be able to drive through, put your ballot into the machine, and it will get counted. Somebody would have to count you off as you went through or mark you off, but you could hold your name up in the car. So interesting. All right. So Sue, we got sidetracked in the middle of yours. Anyone have a question for Brad at this point? Okay, we're back to you, Sue. Okay, thank you. So just wanted to, um update you and, and let you know that there are several local education officials from the 19 affected districts who are going to be testifying in the House Education Committee tomorrow okay. afternoon on this topic. Okay. And then on our overall approach of keeping school boards informed, two weeks ago, the Vermont Superintendents Association hosted a webinar with Mark Perrault as the presenter, um, which was wonderful. Um, the local school officials were able to receive the same economic information that is being provided to legislators. And I'm sure they board, were as uplifted as we are. Yes. <laughs> school board chairs and superintendents participated in the webinar, which was very well presented, of course, and there were many questions asked afterward. Um, and when it was all finished, um, VSBA sent the link to the recorded webinar to all school board members in Vermont. Soon after that, we followed up by sending an alert to school board members regarding the unprecedented fiscal challenges Vermont's public education system is facing due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the latest projections on the education fund deficit. And um, VSA is in the planning stages of another webinar with Mark Perrault as presenter. VSBA has worked with VSA to increase our webinar um, capacity for the number of people that can be on at the same time in order to make it possible this time for all school board members to participate in the webinar. Wow. And are going to continue to keep school boards apprised of developments related to the fiscal challenges facing public education in Vermont. 
Uh, in conclusion, I wanted to let you know that the Vermont School Boards Associ Association stands ready to collaborate and problem solve with the General Assembly and all of the um, parties that have been mentioned in previous testimony today to address the challenges of this once in a lifetime crisis. We hope it's a once in a lifetime crisis. Thank you. Yes, we do. Okay. Any questions? I feel like, do I have a quorum? All right, there's Sandra Sorotkin. There's Sandra Campion. Okay, I guess I do now. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right. I started to have an all but black screen here. All right, any questions? Okay, thank you. And we're going on to Jeff Francis, who I believe is on the phone. Am I reading that correctly? Uh, Jeff, are you there? Yeah. Yep. Yes, I am. Can you, can you hear me okay? We can hear you fine. You gave up on video from home? Well, I can see, I do both. So I use my phone to make sure that we're not interrupted, but I can see you when I'm not looking at documents. So um, okay. Jeff Francis from, Jeffrey Francis from the Vermont Superintendents Association. One benefit of going after Jay and Sue is that a lot of the points that they covered, um, I don't need to cover so I can save you time. Um, I'm briefly going to just hit a couple topics that we're thinking about at the Superintendents Association in addition to the points that that Jay and Sue made, um, which I largely agree with. Um, so one of the fascinating aspects of the COVID crisis navigation is there's a little ton of work to do every day, um, but we now have to look ahead. And um, like the General Assembly, school administrators are contending with the immediacy of the need and also preparing for the future. Um, so in recent days, the emphasis has shifted from contending with the immediacy because people have things in order despite the um, unusual nature of what what's, we're working on right now um, to what it looks like um, coming out of the crisis or post-crisis factors conditions, economy, and so on. So as Jay indicated, there's a lot of in interest in not only closing this school year, but also uh, what we'll need to do in the upcoming school year. Um, a major area of interest, like superintendents and business managers and other school administrators, um, like it is for you, is the fiscal situation. And I, I was quoted recently in a VPR story saying that um, it nearly defies description. And I, I think that um, that's true. We, we have, you know, we talk in terms of $250 million potential ed fund shortfall and, and understanding, um, trying to understand what that, what that may mean. And then we are confronted with um, the most recent uh, example of, of, what we are going to be faced with with the state college situation that you um, spent a fair amount of time on over the last week and will continue to. And, and it leaves me with really three summary thoughts. Um, the first one Jay spoke about, uh, this is not, there's nothing normal about this situation. So my belief and the belief of the association is that we're going to do better navigating the the situation ahead is if we do in fact collaborate and i know that the administration is thinking about how to contend with this i know the general assembly is thinking about how to contend with this and i can tell you that local school officials are thinking about how to contend with it i think that we need to ad take advantage of all that thought process and as jay said put people around the table and say, okay, what are your ideas? Because if the ideas come out in a manner that is not collaborative or collective, there's more potential for people to dismiss the idea, criticize the idea, say the idea is not possible um, because it's coming out from a singular entity 
um, rather than a collective. Um, and I think the conversation is going to be safer, if you will, if it happens as a collaboration. So that's one point I wanted to make. Um, the second thing that I think we're going to have to contend with um, inescapably is what we know about the characteristics of the public education system as it exists today. So for the last 10 years or so, there's been a lot of concern justifiably about the increasing cost of education, which is largely attributable to the number of personnel and the number of buildings that we operate. When I say personnel, I mean across the board. Right. And when I, say, when I say buildings, I mean across the board. And the fact that, um, that, the, that the, those costs have not um, uh, reflected uh, the decline in enrollment. And that's got a lot to do with the characteristics of our system. Um, Act 46 was an effort to uh, create an organizational structure that would enable uh, more nimble response to the decline and to create management and governance structures that were going to be better able to deploy resources um, collectively in response to um, the challenges that we face, including the decline in enrollment. Well, Act 46 recently passed legislation, barely has a foothold, but one of the things that we've witnessed is that the cultural phenomenon in Vermont despite the changes in the organizational structure, made it very, very difficult to make changes to things like personnel and the number of buildings you operate. So one benefit of working collectively and collaboratively um, to address the challenges ahead is because we can speak together in one voice and say, here's the recognition of the problem. Here's what we need to do to address the cost side of the equation. And I think the cost side of the equation is an imperative um, aspect of this, regardless of what we see in terms of federal assistance or, um, or other measures that are taken to compensate for the devastation of the crisis. Because as so many people have said, you want to emerge from this navigation with a system that's going to be responsive in the future. So what does that mean? It means that Despite the fact there are aspects and elements of the current system that many people hold near and dear, if change is imminent because of the nature of the crisis and its implications, then we need to be prepared for that. And the way we better prepare for that is to come together, put our heads together and say, these are necessary adjustments. They're adjustments that we ought to consider together and how are we gonna move forward? Um, and that I think goes to the characteristics of the education delivery system, I think it was reflected in what you saw with the state colleges. I do think it reaches uh, down into or reaches up from the K-12 system. You know, one example is despite the fact that we have such high um, cost per pupil, the General Assembly, if we hadn't experienced the crisis, was going to be contending with how do you contend with the fact that you've got an infrastructure that in many places is depleted because of age and in some instances um, uh, 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 um, uh, maintenance, deferred maintenance. So, you know, that was a big, that was a big policy issue um, two months ago. It's a less policy issue um, today because we're dealing with the COVID-19 crisis. But when, th when things settle to the extent they do, that will be with us. Similarly, and I won't, I won't drone on here, but you know, you were also going to have to contend and still will with the implications of the waiting study, which had some communities in the state, um, I think justifiably asserting that the system might not have been equitable in terms of things like rurality and poverty and um, English language learners. Um, so it's a fairly long winded way of saying if there's going to be a, an adjustment that will be driven by the COVID-19 response. It's an adjustment that needs to take into consideration all the characteristics that I'm speaking of. It's an adjustment that is gonna be with us, um, I think, you know, here to stay. And it's a, an adjustment that we're gonna better navigate if, 
if people say, okay, we have the same understanding of the challenge. These are the opportunities to change. Not going to be political. You know, it's not going to be let's drive this agenda or that agenda. It's how do we dig down deep and come up with the best solutions that give us an equitable education system that is affordable for the taxpayer, that does the job we need to do for the kids of the state of Vermont. Um, so, you know, my appeal uh, is that we get to work on that and include all the parties of interest including um, both administrators and teachers, as well as you and the body you represent and the, and, the, and the administration. I don't think that work, I think that work is happening in, from place to place right now. I do not think that the collective work can start soon enough, quite frankly. No. Thank you. I think that's what I've been trying to say not so well, is that, uh, you're right. I mean, $150 million, but uh, it wouldn't take us long to vote in that much, you know, over the next few years, the increase to the cost in education. Um, unless our economy takes a swift bound forward, we are still have all those issues. Um, what was it two months ago? We were hearing about schools with open sewage draining into their basements and um, play, you know, all kinds of issues, mostly in poorer schools, and they're all still there. But because of the very unanticipated and drastic loss in revenue, forcing <clears throat> us, I think, to accelerate the discussion about how do, before we end up where the state college is ours, how do we create an education system that meets the needs of today's students at a cost we can all afford? Um, and, you know, how do we move our, ourselves there? And maybe this working together uh, will allow us to make some progress on that. Um, because I don't think any of us want to just go out in the traditional raise taxes um, mode on this one. So any questions for Jeff at this point? I'm not seeing any. Okay, no. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Okay, thank you. Okay, and next we have Jeff Fannin. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Um, so for the record, Jeff Fannin from Vermont and EA. Uh, thank you for allowing me time to speak with you today about uh, Vermont's educators and our publicly funded school system. Uh, the last six weeks obviously have been incredible, not just in the unprecedented uh, disruption to all aspects of life, but in the amazing way that first responders, healthcare workers, grocery store clerks, farmers, and other dedicated frontline essential workers uh, are doing an extraordinary job for all of us. Um, I've also watched school employees work tireless to, tirelessly to keep uh, connections with their students. It's truly a bright light in the dark tunnel, uh, dark time that we are just beginning to comprehend the effects of this coronavirus on our school system. Uh, Vermont's health and our state's economic health, uh, it's all mixed in here. My comments here are based upon my ongoing observations and understandings of certain aspects of the pandemic, the demands in the school systems now, and those we anticipate, and, and I think that's important for us to all look at, uh, and the economic issues we all face because of this public health emergency. Uh, the public school systems are meeting the challenges presented by the, the state of emergency. Educators, paraeducators, teachers, bus drivers, food service workers, school nurses, School boards and administrators are doing their parts to ensure that students and families are safe, fed, and they get an education, albeit in the remote environment. Uh, it has its challenges to be sure. Uh, just to name a few, internet connectivity is a major issue across the state and personal protective equipment, PPE, remains scarce for school employees who by virtue of their jobs interact with students and families in person during this pandemic. Uh, the internet connectivity issue is significant and they're uh, found across the, the state, including Chittenden County. 
Uh, as you know, the students that had before the pandemic continue to have, and those are students that did not have before the pandemic continue not to have. And we need to address this inequity. Um, connectivity does not simply mean high access to high speed internet, but it also means having a device uh, and the, the proper bandwidth in your house because you've now got parents and multiple kids as I do in my family uh, who are all working off the same. It might work, I'm at the office literally because I don't have the bandwidth at home. Uh, I left and there were three people on the internet and I couldn't get on. So I, have to, I come to the office. Uh, this type of access is now a basic requirement uh, of education. And it was before the pandemic, we just limped along uh, and did the best we could, but the state needs to seriously address the connectivity issue. It has to be done. Uh, the last three governors made internet connectivity a priority, uh, but the pandemic and school closures have made painfully obvious to every educator and student that we have a long ways to go to achieve this 21st century basic necessity. Well, and during the electrification of the country in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, we need to do the same with uh, internet connectivity to the last mile. We need to do it. It's an issue of fairness and equity for all students, and the pandemic has extended and laid bare the digital divide that has become even more deep. Uh, schools have been sourcing devices for students that lack, de lack a device, and schools have been working with telecom companies to provide internet access to families that lacked it. The state should reduce its, excuse me, the state should redouble its efforts to get more Vermonters connected, uh, especially now that when the lack of reliable high-speed internet with, will throw even more students and families under the economic bus. We've got to do it. Uh, we are seeing and hearing about students uh, who are not doing well, and we anticipate we will see increased needs when schools reopen. Uh, the social, and Jay Nichols mentioned this, and I'm going to go into a little bit more perhaps. The social emotional needs of students are going unmet during this pandemic, and in some cases, students are now in the most unsafe environment. The consequences of these realities will be significant. To better meet these increased needs, we are working with the Northeast Family Institute, NFI, to develop uh, and provide professional development for educators so they are prepared to welcome back students uh, who have suffered some form of harm and or trauma and who will need support in relearning their self-regulation skills and strategies. Uh, the signs are real that students are suffering and schools will be called upon to do more, not less than they were doing before the pandemic. Indeed, Secretary of Education Dan French and, and earlier Jay Nichols uh, both have echoed this now obvious fact that kids will need more services next school year. Uh, we need to prepare for that eventuality now. Uh, the growth in need is already upon us. Just yesterday, I received word that the Windsor County Special Investigations Unit uh, is now reaching out to teachers to do more in terms of checking in with students and their well being. In many cases, teachers are the only adults able to access family, uh, able to assess family conditions and determine whether a child needs protection. And while reports about child abuse are down significantly since the pandemic started, Sadly, the belief is that the ab abuse and neglect continue, but the signs and symptoms are not physically visible to, with students no longer coming to school. The expansion of human services, uh, human services being provided in schools has been a slow, steady creep over many years, and we need to acknowledge it and expand on it, not use it as an excuse to financially penalize schools who are providing such services. The extent of social needs among children has grown steadily, largely without notice outside the schools. And since neither the capacity of our social service agencies nor the state funds have kept pace, it has fallen to Vermont school systems to support necessary and social services that help make ch sure children in school are ready to learn and succeed in life. Uh, and the need will increase after this pandemic. Again, we should not pay for these services through the property tax, but rather the state must fund these services out of the general fund, not the education fund. Uh, our public schools are the cornerstones of our communities and will be, vitally, uh, will be vital community institutions while we work to rebuild our society as we emerge from this pandemic. There is a bill in the house, H804, that we support that would uh, use existing resources to begin to shift schools into community schools to provide social services to students and families. The bill would allow school districts to have a dedicated staff person coordinating 
social services for students and their families by building and deepening partnerships with the community uh, organizations to help meet the needs of not only students, but all community members. This is the right thing to do, but it is an expense that appropriately could be categorized as a general fund obligation. As for the state's education fund fiscal concerns, we believe Congress is working right now to provide greater flexibility for states to use care money uh, to replace lost revenues. The hope is that the next coronavirus le federal legislation will pass and will include, include flexibility you need to address the state's education fund fiscal issues. Um, as Senator Campion noted, uh, we are in contact, or you asked, I'm sorry, uh, we're in contact with our national organization, uh, the largest union in the country, NEA, uh, as they advocate in DC for greater flexibility. And given the increased demands we see coming at schools and the significant resources coming to the state from the federal government in the form of $1.2 billion, we think there is enough money to address the FY20 and FY21 education fund challenges to ensure schools are ready to meet the needs of Vermont students. And finally, I think I mentioned this last time I testified, uh, we firmly believe that Vermonters who are struggling to pay for rent or food because of the pandemic should indeed be afforded extra time to meet their tax obligations. However, a blanket waiver is short-sighted. Those who can still afford to pay their taxes should continue to do so. So giving a blanket deferral will exacerbate, exacerbate the already intolerable gap between wealthy Vermonters and working Vermonters. So we think you should uh, eliminate the, the general waiver uh, of the tax deadline date, if you will, and people who are able to pay should pay, and those who can't should be given some extra time. So that is, that's the, the sum of my testimony, and I'm happy certainly to answer any questions that you might have. Hey, Jeff, first yes. basic question. Is the NEA willing to work with all the school boards associations to come up with a plan to deal with the present deficit and then I think we all know there'll be increased needs next year. Yeah, I, yeah. certainly we, we'll work with anybody and have worked. Uh, we're regularly meeting with the Secretary of Education now and the two prospect, what I call the two prospect folks, the uh, superintendents, school boards and principals and special ed directors. So we're working with them, meeting with them weekly okay. now, which is a good thing and certainly uh, we'll continue to do so. We push for that to be very honest with you and I think it's a good thing to do. And if there are other conversations about the fiscal challenges we face, we want to be at the table as well and welcome that. And certainly we'll participate in that. Okay. But we are working at the, you know, I just want to be clear. We are working at communication last night from NEA, my, the lobbyists down there, they're working to get greater flexibility. So the states have it. And somebody mentioned it earlier. We're one of 49 other states who are dealing with the same loss of revenue. There's a lot of money coming into the state. We think it just needs to be uh, structured in a little bit different way to give you the tools you need to solve the education uh, fund challenges you have. There's money there. We just need to figure out how to use it and use it well. Okay, and that gets me to the next que uh, a question. I meant to ask Jeff Francis. Jeff, are you still here? I see a phone, but it's muted. So he may not be with us. Yeah. Uh, you are here. Yeah. Just wondering, have any discussions started on the uses of the federal money that's coming into the schools? Yeah, I mean, uh, Brad is actually a better able to better able to answer that than I am. It's uh, it's uh, um, so why don't I, I? I'm assuming he's still on. I'll pause rather than well. No, he he but, said it hadn't come in, and I, I understand it's going as a direct grant to the schools. Yeah, but so Mark Peral has talked about that. Brad has talked about that. And I, they're better uh, authorities on it, quite frankly, than I am. Okay, I was just wondering if the superintendents or fiscal officers had started thinking about how that money might be used. But Brad, Yeah, and what I can say to that, and if Brad's on, he'll he's respond. On. Part, part of the context for the work that he did with them around added expenditures and areas of savings was trying to estimate what portion of the, I think, $30 million was going to go in which way, but I'll stop and let him okay. respond. 
Okay, Brad, can you? Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't have a lot to say because I haven't been in great discussions with people, but we, we have told them that, you know, we've given them rough estimates, very rough estimates of what they can expect. And it's roughly 80% of their Title I allocations that they're getting currently this year. That's roughly the amount of money they'll be getting. Um, I have pointed out to them, I've sent them the language as to what is in the CARES Act as to what the monies can be used for. As I said, um, two of them are fairly broad, um, but we are still waiting on guidance from the federal folks themselves. Okay. I have not, I, I know that there is a, the leadership group within AOE itself is coming up with some general guidelines as to what the monies can and can't be used for. They're working on how to look at what we're gonna put out as grants. You know, because this is going to have to be a grant program of some sort where they're going to have to, we're going to make it as simple as possible, where they're going to have to apply for the money. Obviously, we're going to say yes, but um, there, it's going to have to have um, their their work, work pieces in, in it, and, you know, make sure that we need to review those and make sure that they're allowable. Because what we don't want to do is come back and say that these things were allowable, find out they were not for the federal folks, and then have to take the money back and pay it back. Right. Okay. To answer your question directly, I don't have good information as to what people, the business managers, the superintendents, and folks in the field are, are thinking in terms of how okay. they will use the money specifically. Senator Sorokin, you have a question? I do. Thank you. Uh, uh, Jeff Fannin uh, brought the topic up that we've been dealing with off and on for the last week about uh, blanket delays and being mm -hmm. able to pay. Uh, property taxes or remissions to the Department of Education by towns, uh, waiving penalties. And it sounds like the NEA has some trepidation going down that road for some of the reasons that I think Senator McDonald mentioned this morning in terms of waiving things, certainly for commercial and second homeowners. Uh, and I'm wondering if other groups uh, who were talked to us today have an opinion on that issue, which we seem to be headed down the road to at least discussing, because it sounds like the league is going to be a be asking us to do that. They have asked. They have asked. Okay. Anybody else have a thought about delaying? I think the bill that's come out of GovOps gives each town the ability to waive interest penalties um, to change their due dates, which should just impact inside the town, but they have also asked us to do away with the 8% penalty if they don't pay all the due property tax. And I think some of us have some concerns about, at least I do, about the potential for not collecting taxes that we could and should collect because those folks haven't lost their jobs. So uh, Brad, I think I saw you first, then Senator McDonald. I don't know if I saw anybody else. Okay, Brad. It just just very briefly, um, Mark Mark and Chloe sent, this, this, sent that draft to me yesterday and asked me to look at it and kind of weigh in on it. And the waiving of the penalty is money lost to the state. Um, but if, if towns do push back their tax due dates, not necessarily this year, but next year, um, then what will happen is that could, that, will, that could conceivably cause a bit of a cash flow problem for the school districts. They won't be getting the tax property to education property tax they, on the normal schedule they expect, which means they'll probably have to do short-term borrowing which they normally do at the beginning of the year anyway, but it would be for an extended period of time, thereby, therefore increasing, or thereby increasing um, costs to the district via, via interest rates. I, I, you can look at that two ways. Um, it's the same taxpayer we're talking about, a municipal tax rate if the town has to borrow, an education tax rate if the, if the, if the school district has to borrow, kind of which pocket do you want to pay out of your left hand one or your right hand one, but, but it's, it's, it's Either, either way, it's going to have a cost. I don't know if one is more beneficial than the other. Okay. And it has been suggested rather than waive the penalty, we might discuss contributing to the interest or the borrowing cost. So um, 
though that's what I know of that's on the table. Senator McDonald. Um, this, we talked yesterday, I believe, or a couple of days ago about how to uh, get some legal advice on um, how we might help Mrs. Murphy or uh, Mr. and Mrs. Murphy in paying their school taxes if they've been laid off or they're out of work um, and how we can legally distinguish between um, forgiving those people who um, resident uh, homeowners and not waive uh, Snowflake or Jay Peak or uh, National Life or any other business interest who is wise enough and thoughtful enough to say, um, why should I pay my taxes any sooner than I'm obliged to? Um, the, whether it's a condo association or a, uh, a, a property in Stowe that's being, or some other place being used to launder um, oligarch money, um, why would we be extending to those properties um, and those folks with such resources, such a, an 8% waiver um, just so we can help Mrs. Murphy who will sell her Volkswagen um, to Beetle in order to pay her property taxes on time and not be embarrassed. Okay, Senator McDonald, I will recognize you again, provided you um, reserve your comments about wealthy places to the mansions I have personally seen in the hills of Orange County. Absolutely. And those here, folks here. don't pay based on income. <laughs> you hope. <laughs> okay. I think, and I, I believe we did ask Abby to do some looking into that. I mean, I don't think we can discriminate between Vermonters and non-Vermonters and but I think we also know that there are businesses, small businesses that have been closed um, that don't have resources. And there seem to be some federal monies out there, but it's again, gonna be putting a package together. Senator Sorotkin, I just, that's your field. Uh, I just would like to uh, ask if the school boards and the principals association, superintendent association could answer the question. I think we've gotten, <laughs> we've gotten an opinion from sure, Jeff Fannin, but we haven't heard from the other part. Yeah, so this is, this is Jeff Francis. Um, I haven't thought much about that question yet, but today on a call um, with the superintendents and Secretary French, a superintendent mentioned that, the implications of that. So um, my immediate reaction is that to the extent taxes can be collected and people are available and able to pay the taxes, um, they should. So I, you know, I, like I said, I haven't really thought it through, but the implications of a blanket delay or a determination that communities on a case by case basis could make that determination, um, I think is a challenging notion. And it's precisely the type of question or among the questions that I think ought to be put in the middle of a table with representatives of the administration, municipal officials, local school officials, um in the general assembly because it's easy to sort of parse that out and make a decision or make take a position like i'm taking right now based on my my best available thinking it's something entirely different to have all the thought process laid out in front of you and collectively come to the best decision and i think that there it's one example of scores of decisions that are going to need to be considered um and addressed Madam Chair, I asked for a legal, we get, we get a proper legal opinion yes. on where such discrimination um, may be lawfully exercised and where it may not be, the Constitution okay. prohibits and for We such did ask Abby Shepard, who is our counsel, to yeah. um, look into that for us, and we will invite her back to give us her conclusions. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else at this point? Uh, Jay Nichols. Hi. Yeah, I'll just I'll just comment on that as well. I think uh, you know, full disclosure. Last night I was sitting here making a list of all the things I thought we could do, and a lot of them made me sick to my stomach. But one of the things that did come up was 
maybe there's some kind of threshold as to who's allowed longer time to pay their property taxes and who who isn't. Uh, I agree. I agree with Jeff Fannin's uh, premise that those that are able to pay, we should want mm -hmm. them to pay now to put more money in our revenue coffers. And those who can't, we should, you know, that really can't, we should afford them the opportunity to delay yeah. until they can. And I think the way it's being explained to us by the government operations committee is that towns can do this now with a vote of the community, but a vote of the community is all but impossible under the present stay at home order. And so this would allow the select board, but I would hope that the schools would be amongst those consulted before your select board makes a decision. And I think it also would, um, depending on how these decisions go, influence how we might vote on allowing the towns not to be responsible for paying in all the property tax that is owed, education fund tax, before I get corrected. Um, Senator Sorotkin, did I see your hand up? No, he's muted now. No, I was just agreeing with you, Madam Chair. Okay. Other questions? All right, Mark. Yeah, I, I just want to jump in and point out that um, apart from the whether taxpayers can pay or not, simply allowing municipalities to move the dates at which they collect and remit the tax doesn't solve anything. It just moves the problem from the municipality to the school district. So rather than having the municipality have to borrow short term, the school district has to borrow short term. So I, I, again, I, it, this is a complicated cash flow and Brad can jump in here if I'm wrong, but um, simply delaying the payments that come from the municipalities, I don't think accomplishes anything. Were the schools consulted by the government operations committee as part of this discussion? Were any of you involved? No. Okay. That's interesting. All right. Good to know. Um, any other questions, comments? Senator Brock. Just one observation regarding taxpayers particularly corporate taxpayers who take advantage of a delay on the payment due date. One of the most powerful uh, things that we have that encourages tax payment is the publication of the name of an individual who does not pay property taxes on time in a town report. Would it be conceivable to at least think about the notion of keeping the date the same as it is, except allow a, uh, a delay without penalty uh, and perhaps just apply it to uh, non-resident property holders that those who payment is made on the due date originally listed be listed in the tax report. Just okay. a thought. That's something else we can ask Abbott. Well, that one will probably get kicked to more of a constitutional, but can we? Certainly publish it now when people don't yeah. pay but can we exclude Vermonters and just put second homeowners in there? Well, Maybe you're, you're doing not the home, not residents. Property tax. In other words, yeah. you're doing that for Vermont. They own a property. You're treating people alike, regardless of their location. We're just right. not doing it on. We're doing it on one class of property. One class of property. Okay. Um, Brad, did I see your hand? No. Okay. Mark, I saw your hand. Uh, uh, I, 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 municipalities do have the authority to waive those interest and penalties, I think, on their own. It's just that they can't then not remit the full amount of education right. property tax that's due to the state. So um, two, yeah. two slightly different issues. Yes. And we've been told that the latter is ours. The former is GovOps. So they've been the good guys and given the towns all the permission they want. And we're going to get probably to say no. Senator Sorotkin. Well, just uh, following up on Senator Brock with a, a solution here is, as I understand the problem from the finance committee's perspective, or soon to be the finance committee's perspective, is the town's uh, 
may want to give relief to a lot of people who are hurting right now. And if they, one choice is to give a blanket exemption from penalties and interest. Uh, but part of the reason they're doing that is they have a process already called the abatement process, but uh, I'm on the board of abatement and we'll just get buried with requests. I'm wondering if it might not be something we can think about where we could set a standard whereby an abatement would be granted such as a form affidavit that somebody submits and it's just a paper thing and then they get their abatement and they just basically have to say, I lost my job or I lost my income and therefore we distinguish between those who need it and those who don't and we get rid of the heavy administrative burden of having all these board of thousands of board of abatement hearings. You're not getting a whole lot of sympathy from me since my first year in the board of abatement, we did the first cap tap program and found all the bugs. And I forget how many thousands of tax appeals. I saw more moldy basements that year than I have as a realtor. Um, well, that's just off the top but of it my can head. be done, but yeah. yeah, but I don't think we want taxes abated. I think we're hoping that this is temporary and that those people will be back to work. Maybe just the penalty be abated then. Maybe the pen they can do that now. I think it's blanket abatements um, that would do everybody. Um, it's blanket moving the dates that will at least delay and complicate what is already going to be a delay. Well, they're going to have to move the dates anyway, because we aren't going to have the homestead declarations until July 15th. So I don't think any, if not very few towns are going to be able to get those out and get their tax bills out in a reasonable time for people to pay on August 15th. That's Montpelier's. I think that's as early as anyone goes. So we're probably going to have at least that first date in those towns that pay then move back maybe only by a couple weeks. But that also hits when schools are trying to gear up. So a um, lot of fine details here. All right, any other questions at this point? If not, William Talbot is back with us. Welcome back, Bill. Oh, thank you. I think you, do you, you know everybody. I think everybody knows you. Okay. So, all right, so thank you. Bill Talbot, I've been contracted with the Joint Fiscal Office. Oh, Mark's got a note. Of course, yeah, but Mark hasn't figured out his notes come out in mirror vision. Well, I thought it was just a typical Mark note. <laughs> well, maybe that's it too, when I was giving him the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I was just trying to follow the abatement. Towns can't abate the education tax. Only a tax commissioner can do that. They have to collect their lay the heavy. But um, ah, they can do the town tax then. Yeah, they can't abate the education tax. That's the tax. Oh, okay, tax. good. Yeah. One problem solved. Fifty-four hundred nine of Title Thirty-Two. But I mean, so I really have nothing to add. This Jeff said it earlier. Francis said it earlier. You go late. You, everybody says it all now. Even more has been said. I mean, I mean, I'm gonna. I'm working. I love working with the Joint Fiscal Office. Those people are very gr good. They're talented. Your guys are lucky you have them. Uh, yeah. I, I always appreciate working with uh, Mark, and maybe I'll even get to work with Brad again a little bit. Um, but so I could just, you know, what it, what occurs to me though is that the options are really pretty clear. Um, when when I've been, so I got involved in, in I was in the House starting in 1987, and we've had our ups and downs in the last 33 years, but they've all been with a manageable, a difficult maybe, but manageable band. Um, uh, and this is far outside that, or at least it appears to be, appears yeah. to be far outside that. So you all know that, I'm saying the obvious, but, but um, you, could, you, you, you balance the F fund with the, with the yield, the two yields, the income and the property yield and the non-residential property tax rates. Uh, and, and so you can do that mathematically with this problem, which is a better handle on what I think it is. And it, you know, it's like a roller coaster. One day it doesn't seem so bad, the next day it's the end of everything. But you can do that on paper, and, and, and it all works, and the numbers will add up. And, and as you've all said, but can the people pay the bill? 
And um, right. so, yeah, so what do you have to do? Look at the Break it up, Bill. I'm sorry, I'm probably walking too fast, I always do. So you can, you got four options. You know, you can look at spending and try to reduce that. You can try to find a, a an economic tax base that we haven't touched yet, if there is such a thing. Um, well, you know, I was trying to tax hemp cigarettes, but you know, that one hasn't you know, this come up. Turn, turn everything over, all the stones. <laughs> um, and then, and then you, you, look, you look, you hope, well, you got a little federal money you might be able to use. And then if those things leave you short, you can borrow. And I mean, I, I, Really, what other, what other choices do you have? I, and maybe somebody will come up with something, but it sounds like we got four choices here. And 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 <clears throat> excuse me, the reality yeah. of this situation is that it's just really going to be um, unlikely that any of those really work that well. Um, but you got to give it a shot. It so um, it's some combination, I would think. Probably. I mean, I, I, the, the, an early idea I had. Uh, right off uh, which was last week was that you know you'd add a line to the to the ed fund outlook under under sources that was debt <laughs> and so you you'd figure out what your shortfall was and then you'd fill the gap with debt and then later on a couple of years you'd add a new line um to, to the uh pay it back uh, pay off the start, debt you add another line where you start paying the debt back and you finance it over as many years as you can spread it just like flattening the curve doesn't uh, really just spreads everything out over more time and buys you time. Right. This is kind Keeps of the same you from idea. being overwhelmed. Well, yes. So hopefully you can you can find ways to finance this through borrowing if it's that bad that you can spread out over time. I, I you know I just I mean I'm glad I'm I'm getting an opportunity to scratch head my head with people um, and see if there's anything else. But it seems like it's pretty cut and dry. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean I I had assumed we would. Yeah, we've got the 19 million. That that's that's the kind of thing we deal with. You know, that that we can manage. 150 to 250 million dollars and there's the next year we haven't even gotten to. We know this coming year folks that lost their jobs aren't going to get tax rebates unless we can figure out a way to make the system work for them. So this will be a miserable year. The next year, they probably will get a rebate because it'll be based on this year's income, or some of them will. Um, but hopefully by then they'll be back working. So we've got, this is like our three year average on things. We've, unless we can find a way to make it easier for people to get a rebate this coming year, I think we have the potential of doing a lot more rebates the year after. And this may not be a two year problem. And, and another, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the big question we're all hoping to get some more information on, but I don't think anybody knows at this point. I mean, the, no. look at the country, the states are all over the map or maybe we got some experiments going, unintentional experiments going on there that might point to point out some mistakes or, or some things that work for us. But um, otherwise, we're just kind of grasping in the dark. You, you know, another management thing we might look at, it is it gets in, involved with the difficulty that towns are going to might have in collecting taxes. And it, and it presents some perhaps cash flow issues is the way it works is mm -hmm. towns collect the education tax on behalf of the state. And they pay all of that to the school district up to the right. amount of the school district's budget and anything right. that might be left over they forward to the state on, in December 1st and June 1st and and if they are late with that that's where the eight percent penalty comes in that's not all the just towns that's just some of them that's only the ones that have collected enough or more than what their school budget obligation is but you know you could you could change how that works a little bit if it made any sense or if it would help so that you would say that the towns uh, don't have to give everything that they collect to the school district they only give a, a portion of that and anything over that yeah. they would give to the state and that puts the problem on the state but then you just have one borrower the state that you, know, you would accumulate the shortfall then at the state level and then the state okay, would, yeah would borrow the, the rest because um, that was my concern is that the towns could delay or rebate and then they would pay their school but there wouldn't be anything left to send to the state because they didn't collect it, not because they didn't owe it. And if we did away with 
any kind of penalty on that, um, we could see some of those poorer receiving towns um, really be in dire straits. So, uh, I mean, yeah, yes. So, I mean, there, there's some things you can do to play around with it. To, um, you know, we've talked for a long time about why doesn't the state collect its own education tax, which presents its own problems. This would be kind of a phase in toward that direction, but it, it just consolidates the issues the towns will have at the state level, and maybe the state can manage it. I think that. the towns figured out there was some benefit to them. I remember that discussion, and the, the town clerks changed, changed their opinion on that. They make a little money on it, and the bank, the local banks, you know, get yeah. the deposits, and they like that. They don't want to yeah, lose Yeah, they do lot short term loaning yeah. and borrowing. Sure. Okay, Mark, you have something to. Yeah, I, I just wanted to point out on, on the on the eight the eight percent penalty seems to me to be kind of a red herring because what mm -hmm. there's no reason for a district to have to run into the eight percent penalty. Right. They can go out and borrow. It would it would be municipal um, finance malpractice to run into that eight percent penalty. It's, yeah. it's there so that they make the payments and they yeah. can borrow to make those payments otherwise. So what they're what they're telling you is not that they don't want to pay an eight percent penalty. It's they're telling you we don't want to make the payment. Right. They want to. They want us to have to borrow, which yes. essentially means whatever they don't collect gets added to the deficit. Um, yep. And something tells me they aren't going to like the increased tax rate to pay off the deficit. So, okay, another uplifting day in finance. <laughs> All right. Well, I hope that we can start getting a group together. And I don't know, it might work best to let the school folks, there's, oh, that's a cat, Senator McDonald, um, have, you know, have the group start having the hard discussions because unless there is a major uh, federal bailout. Th there's there's going to have to be some hard, not like there isn't hard decisions every year, but this year may be more painful than most. And it makes me a little nervous that the administration hasn't chimed in, except they'd like to, as we redo the state colleges, redo the entire education system. And that just the enormity of that task makes me very nervous, um, especially given the ease with which we can communicate as the Brady Bunch here. Um, this isn't the, the easiest way to, <laughs> to discuss. So we'll work on it. Okay, anybody else? Anything else? Okay, we are finished early. So thank you, everyone. Committee next week, Faith and I are gonna try and find an hour or half hour tomorrow to do um, agendas. Anybody have anything you want? I mean, we keep at this point, I will say I am not, very encouraged by the response we've gotten from the department on the broadband money and what we're doing to go after it. It feels very lackadaisical. I will say I am unimpressed with the value of hotspots, except maybe to teenagers who want to go stand on a street corner with their phones but it's not going to do a lot for telemedicine or teleeducation or remote work. And it'd be good so you can contact your mother and tell her you're still alive. But, um, and I'm starting to wonder, can we put a little more teeth in? I mean, I just found out we're all going to get a rebate on our auto insurance. Um, 
I've been asked, or maybe we can have that discussion next week. I've got a couple issues. One came up with um, farm workers. Apparently, a large number of the farmers carry them on their books as the employees, and they deduct taxes and unemployment and all kinds of other stuff that we all get taken out. But they have an individual tax number. But because they don't have a social security number, they can't get a tax return. And they can't get social security, even though it's been being paid in. So I thought that, you know, at least we can't do anything at the federal level, but maybe at the state level, um, somehow I end up always owing the state more than the feds. Uh, and it may just be how the money's taken out, but if we could look at that. And the other one was the Chamber of Commerce, and I can't imagine mine is alone, is concerned about credit card costs since they're now doing all their work remotely and payment is all remotely. And I know for some very small sales, the charge, the credit card charges are more than the sales. So, or the profit on the sales. So are they proposing something? No, I just said, okay. those are two issues that have been brought up to me. Yeah. If we want to look at them, um, I'm more interested in broadband, and I looked yes. at Senator Brock, who is our resident expert. Well, I, I share, Madam Chair, your, your your comments. I think were were right on the money. I'm uh, I'm very unimpressed with what we've been hearing, and I'm very concerned that we have uh, obviously a much greater need even now for broadband. We have. Uh, a significant amount of money presumably coming in to help address that need. And the absence of a plan or a strategy, I think is a, is a major issue that this committee needs to look at. And even if we're not gonna get our 10 year plan, I think we know that not in time to apply for federal money this year. Senator McDonald, you're going apoplectic. <laughs> You've got to you're, you're, uh, unmute yourself, Senator. Can I have this power in committee where I can just mute him? <laughs> no, you shut off your video. <laughs> the, we're back to the problem of the back in the Great Recession where there was money available for shovel ready pro projects yeah. to jumpstart the economy. Um, we have a place to jumpstart the economy with broadband, but the federal government requires a plan. And we don't have one. And we're, once again, we're caught flat footed on that one. And yeah. the, the only person that had a plan um, a few years ago was Michel Vite. I think he's the only one that's got one now. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's and, involving hotspots and 5G. So, so that's where the money goes, not to. to well, I'm, let's. I'm sure, that. I'm sure that we can. To, in fact, it goes to the person that has a plan that's okay. ready to go. And so how do we get a plan? Well, that's that's the real issue. Now we know that the department has at least done, begun doing their piece of the 10 year telecommunications plan. We know based on past uh, uh, experience that it is likely to be incomplete and, and not as far along as we have. Uh, the question becomes one of whether or not uh, we can, perhaps using federal money, perhaps using money that we've set aside like the 900,000 that we have as right. capital for uh, the, the hotspots to be able to get the funds to actually get some planning done using outside people who are competent and capable of doing it. It may not be the full 10-year telecommunications plan, but we need a strategy for deploying broadband to address right. this issue. We need to start working on it now. We can't work now. We do have to at least understand better, which I hope we will be able to do based on what we're told within the next week or so, what the parameters are around that federal money in terms of what we can and what we can't do. But at least I think we do need to think about how we get the plan and the jumpstart of the planning done. And I, I think we need to begin talking about that now. I think we do too. So let's have the department and maybe the board. I mean, it's nice to ask, 
folks to put up hot spots, but I was thinking more of you'll run a couple more lines of fiber up the mountain um, and keep track of your cost. And, you know, we'll, if we get federal money, we'll pay you back. So far, the cable companies are giving you a couple of three weeks, which, you know, if you're hooked up, it really isn't costing them anything to have it run into your house. I mean, it, it, it's, 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 you know, they aren't sending any personnel out there, but I haven't seen that they have stepped up that much. And um, maybe we need to initiate the, so what are you going to do? Um, with the department? I'm thinking of with the providers. Mm -hmm. Well, I the only clarification question I have is, uh, I know there is an, uh, there are some plans that we have asked for in the past in legislation. Is that accurate? I mean, they are working they're, from- They're supposed to do a 10 year some, plan. Right, but aren't they working from other sort yeah. of draft plans? Could we get, I, I don't know, it's, this is a, it feels like a, what is it, Groundhog Day, this constant conversation. Yes. Um, and, and somehow, But I am afraid, and I think we all are afraid that, you know, we are going to lose out on uh, some real funding and some really powerful implementation of broadband uh, unless we act pretty quickly. And we got some... No, an independent person outside the state during the recovery got some large grants. As I understand, the kind of transmitter stuff that got put in really wasn't up right. to the levels that it needed to be. That's right. And I was told we then couldn't get other rural development grants because we had gotten all of this money. So if we leave a vacuum, I'm pretty sure it will get filled in the same way because right. that's just one person that's got to put together their plan mm -hmm. and, and do this. Um, we need to, even if it's not a 10 year plan, have an emergency response telecom plan. Given that this, virus is likely to come back in the winter when we can't get home health nurses out, when we can't get, you know, so we need to be able to get telecom so that you can do telemedicine. We have no idea if those kids are going back to school or not in September or for how long. So we need to have those, you know, Ray, Those I, I areas agree. mapped, and that's why I've been asking the schools, we, right. where are the clusters where, you know, 80% of your kids don't have access? Well, or Madam Chair, I wonder if this is really a conversation to start to have with some of the communication yeah. union districts. I mean, we yeah. these were structured. Some of them actually probably have these this kind of information. They I mean, might. in a way, they kind of bypass, correct me if I'm wrong, the department. Here you have chairs and vice chairs in just a, in a number of different counties that have done research. They're trying to, they're meeting. Um, well, they we might. ask them in. I'm not sure they're any more shovel ready than we are. Okay. Because they I mean, have financing okay. issues. Yeah, they're just, most of them are just getting started. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But but overall, we need a strategy. Yeah, you know, we can have all these individual pieces in, and we get a little bit of a of, of a slice of a much broader problem. But the total of all these slices do not total a hundred percent. We need a top level strategy of how we're going to approach broadband in Vermont. We don't have that. That was part no, we don't. of a concept of a ten year telecommunications plan, but we've never had it or at least the, the plans that have been presented to us have been grossly inadequate. They've been aspirational. They haven't been practical. To, to, to get what we not, I think that we've got to go hire some expertise 
who have the capability of doing it. They may not do everything for the 10 year telecommunications plan. This is one piece of it, but it's a critically so, important piece. Let's see if we couldn't use some COVID money to do that, um, to, to fill the holes we found in those yeah. two things that they like, the medicine and the education, and get that in there. Um, and then go, you know, develop on that. I think what's happened, at least recently, is that the plan has been written to reflect not, it is, it isn't a, it's being driven by the money, meaning we're not raising any more. And so rather than do a plan as to what it should look like, we're saying, well, we've only got what we've got left over in the connectivity fund. So uh, we can do three miles a year or 10 miles a year. That, that's a work order. That's not yeah. a plan. I'd still, Madam Chair, oh. like to hear from the CUDs because what I'm hearing is that okay. it's a funding issue from them. They actually, I mean, they need money okay. to go and get their plans done. And again, right. but, it seems to me that we should at least have them at the table. We approved their work last year and and I'm not sure who best to ask. I mean, we could add the person from Bennington County, that'd be fine, or the oh, person- I think from... that would be fine. Okay, I'll check with give that. Give it over to Beth, to Faith. I, I've yeah, got give Senator Ballant, did I see you next? Yeah, and then Senator McDonald. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if, Anne, you could reach out to the chair of the committee in the House that's overseeing IT, get ourselves together for a joint hearing. I agree with Senator Campion. Let's hear from the, the CUDs. But let's also, if, if we're currently feeling like we can't rely on the department to help us get a plan, then we've got to build it. And I mean, yeah. I think we will all look back six months from now if we don't go after this money and, and really feel pretty crappy about the whole situation. I don't want to feel that way. So the extent no. to which let's get the right people in the room around telehealth, around schools, and let's let's start building the plan to get that money. Okay, so let's talk to the, it's House Energy and Technology, right? Rep Briglin? Briglin. Briglin. And... Um, and, and Madam Chair, it is also the Joint IT Oversight Committee, and there are a few okay. ends people like Senator Kitchell, for example, who's on that committee. We'll invite everybody. And I'm going to have the chair of the Bennington County uh, CUD speak a little bit about his work. Okay. Would you ask him to check with the other? Absolutely with the other chairs. CUDs and find out, give us a report about how they are, um, you know, if they're ready to go or, you know, if somebody else wants to sort come in. Sort of what in, their needs are, absolutely. Um, we'll get somebody probably from the BNAs and the hospitals um, to talk about how they're doing. And I don't know which one of the school folks we have in to talk about particular needs. We'll just throw that out to all of them and tell them to pick a spokesperson. Um, so we got Madam Chair. hospitals and VNAs. Okay, that should keep us busy. Send to Sirajkin. I just wanna make it unanimous. Uh, I feel similarly to the rest of the committee and also to fully make it unanimous. I had a conversation with Senator Pearson after yesterday's hearing or two days ago. Oh yeah, where did Senator I'm, Pearson go? And I'm sure he would echo the sentiments to the rest yeah. of the committee. Okay. Madam Chair. Yes. The, when we approach this, this situation piecemeal, such as the commissioner telling, asking for volunteers and then suggesting that they might be reimbursed. Every time we spend money to do cheap, low grade yes. um, broadband, no we problem. make it more expensive to serve the, the everybody. No, I think we constantly learned, get ourselves yeah. in this position where 
because there's an emergency, we give everybody a Yugo um, and when they need a proper vehicle. And no, we it are makes not it more giving, expensive yeah. for the next step. So yes, no, I think for, we have long for, decided. We may have to back down a little bit on 100, 100. Um, but I think we've decided no copper that we're looking at. And we've at decided five. symmetrical. Yes. Yeah. Which uh, I've yeah. heard 50 50 thrown out. Right. And, and then there's fiber. Yes, there's fiber. There's 100 100. So, well, fiber is whatever. Once you have fiber, it goes as high as whatever. Whatever. But, whatever you yeah. can, you can but get. But when it. you allow the, the privately owned, unregulated companies to gradually get out into the more of the market, you make it more and more difficult for the community groups that want to serve everybody. You make the price tag well, higher that's... for those community groups because they lose customers. Okay, so we've got Bennington Fiber, we've got Central Vermont, we've got EC Fiber, and we've got, there's a Northeast Fiber, up or Kingdom Fiber, is it? There's one in St. J. I don't know, I don't know of another one. But if we call any one of these guys, they probably do. So I'll see if Faith can. Faith is listening. I've just. Senator I, um, I, I am listening and taking notes, although I want to talk with you. And I also want to remind you that the Health, Energy, and Technology Committee interviewed four, P, four CUDs about a week and a half ago. Um, so uh, it may make sense to really kind of that you connect with uh, Chair Briglin. Yes. Sort of Madam it. Chair, may I ask Faith to just email us those four folks? I'd just be curious who they are. Absolutely. Thanks, Faith. Well, let's see. I only came up with four, so I think you can assume that it's all of them. <laughs> uh, but unless I missed one somewhere up in the Northwest. But OK. So maybe we'll set up a conversation. Maybe we won't have, maybe we will just ask House Energy and Technology to report back to us what they learned, see if they're interested in doing this joint hearing. Um, but I will talk to Representative Breglin and um, see if they're interested. And then there's scheduling. I believe next week the House is voting. First they're voting to allow remote voting and then I think, do you know Becca on a separate day they're having a... Can you say it again Ann? The house is meeting next week. I've heard Wednesday, I've heard Friday or both. I think we're going to get the update tomorrow in joint rules because um, it's not clear to me. Okay. So we'll be working around that. I know money chairs has been, were, and joint fiscal have both been trying to work around that. Um, and I'm not sure it's even set in stone at this point. Okay, well that will give us Monday or Tuesday, or Tuesday or Thursday next week. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, one of the things that I think would be useful is perhaps to ask joint fiscal about how much money the state has invested over the years in broadband initiatives and what the result of those investments have been. I just have a gut feeling that we've shoveled money out to large telecom providers for years to get to the last mile and we're not there and we're not likely to get, given what we're doing. So I'd like to see what money has been given, what to whom, what the results have been. Uh, to me, that is an integral part of, of creating a strategy. Hearing from people that may be individual providers, uh, telecom companies, uh, e uh, companies that are, are communication uh, union district, that's all well and good to help inform us mm -hmm. on the money, but it still doesn't get to the overall problem of we could see what we're doing, but the question is what should we be doing? And what's our strategy to link all of these various elements together in order to get where we wanna get? I'm very concerned that we will spend a lot of time looking at the educational piece 
uh, uh, because it's in the COVID bill that will distract us from looking at the larger picture of which education is just one slice. Right. If, if the lines get, are up, anything I, can go the rest on. Together. If we and I would just say look, in response and, to response um, to that is this, we, you know, we directed the CUDs to uh, achieve the goal of universal coverage. I think they've got to be part of this conversation. Oh, yeah, no, no one's leaving them out. agree with that. I you agree. got two different, this is a report from Joint Fiscal. Oh, I su fully support what Senator Brock's talking about in terms of the dollars that have gone out in dealing with this yeah, issue. Yeah, that's all. Really this would be, uh, this This will keep Graham busy for a while. Okay, Senator Ballant, you had I your just hand thought up. Brock just... was trying to shut me down as usual. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's the opposite ends of the state. You wanted me to get rid of that phone. I had an irate landlord and the phone came up here last night. It's the landline. Okay, Senator Ballant. Uh, well, given that we have a former auditor in the committee, I'm just wondering, is there a role the auditor's office can play here in looking at what uh, was supposed to be done and what what wasn't done in conjunction with joint fiscal? I just, I'm curious, is there a role for yeah. Hopper to play or uh, not really? It might be if, if you, you go into another level of depth, but uh, it may well be that joint fiscal has the information. If they don't have the information, they don't have the ability to get it, then I, I think we could perhaps talk about that. Okay. And they'd know if the auditor has done the investigation, I think. Work in this area, I, that I don't yeah. know. I haven't heard anything. Okay. That'll keep us busy. But I so won't one, have to talk about deficit. One of the things that I'd add, though, to all of that is, you know, regardless of, of, of what's been done in the past, I, I think it's very important that we not look backward because we could spend a lot of time and effort doing that. But look forward. Right. It's not just what we've done, because we know that what we've done hasn't entirely worked. The question is, what should we be doing? Right. What's our plan to do it? And how do we go get a plan to help us do it and to do it fast enough so we can take advantage of what we have coming from the COVID money? And I'd like someone to tell us what that money is, what we have to do to be ready to get it. All I get is nothing. Hot spots, which make me itch. I, I know it's making me feel like we all got hemorrhoids or something. We're talking about the hot spots. I know my dog had hot spots. I used to have to put the stuff on. All right. All right. That that's good. So I will see some of you, I think, tomorrow at 8 30. That one I do have on my calendar. I don't know how I missed this morning's. Um and I, I shall see some of you tomorrow morning and I'll let you know, we'll get the agenda out. It's a, a fluid process. So any corrections, additions, subtractions, let us know and we'll get it done. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now. Day's work.